Hello friends, this is Jim here uh, from Science Talk with a Jim Responds uh, segment. Recently I was on a podcast, uh, Environmental Coffee House, uh, with uh, Sandy Shellis and uh, Antonio Reed. And uh, in that particular podcast, we were, uh, Antonio and I were discussing uh, the latest IPCC report and some possible mitigations, what needs to be done, you know, discussion along those lines. At some point during the discussion, the topic of geoengineering arose. And uh, as, as those of you who've been following me for some time uh, know that uh, I'm not exactly a fan of geoengineering for the simple reason they're just not going to work. And uh, you may get some local promising results. But if you want to really change what's happening globally, that's a much taller order. And what I've seen so far have proven to be anything but promising. And as an example of that, I used, uh, I cited the iron seeding experiment that was done in the oceans, specifically the Eastern Pacific Ocean. And uh, I reported that uh, it was tried uh, three times or so, and uh, the results were not good. And as a result of the results not being good, uh, the project was ended. A gentleman uh, responded to me, telling me that uh, I was wrong. He said that I need to go back and look at the data again because there were spectacular blooms. That's his quote. Okay, let me respond to that. First of all, what is meant by spectacular bloom? That is a completely subjective uh, verbiage. It has zero scientific meaning. It's, and it's worthless, to be blunt. The way we look at productivity is we like to calculate a, a parameter and we give it the units, and the units are grams of carbon per square meter per year. Sometimes you might see per day, but usually it's per year. So grams of carbon per square meter per year. That's the usual way we report that. and We can measure it. Now, where, where's the square meter? The square meter is usually taken at the bottom layer of the photic zone. The photic zone is how far light penetrates down to. So if, for example, light penetrates down to 100 meters, we would look at the productivity one square meter at that 100 meter level. We measure the, and we, we can do that. We can then measure the grams of carbon. So if you wanted to know the whole productivity, of that little slice of water column, you know, take that square meter and go all the way up to the surface with that, you simply integrate over the water column and then you get you know, a total grams of carbon per unit volume, you know, a, a total volume of it, what, you know, is one square meter times, a, say, 100 meters up, okay, so you got you know, what's that, 100 cubic meters. So you can get a total gram carbon per 100 cubic meters per year. We can do this sort of stuff then. And when you look at that, what we find is that the productivity taken collectively was not any significant different than the usual productivity for that area. Now, there was a single study that seemed to show uh, some interesting results in that there was an increase in productivity, but it was short-lived. So let me back up a little bit and kind of give you a bit more background. The whole idea of iron seeding was proposed back in the mid-80s, as I recall, and it was that, okay, Iron is a micronutrient that phytoplankton need. So if you give 
this micronutrient to the phytoplankton, it will help spur their growth. And if we can spur their growth, then they're going to use up you know, the carbon dioxide that's in the water, which will then allow carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere to replace what the phytos have incorporated into this tissues, into their, you know, the, you know, the cells and so forth. And therefore, this would draw down the CO2. And if you draw down enough CO2, you can help offset, mitigate some of the warming that's taking place and maybe lead to a cooling down. That's the, the, the idea behind all of this. Well, it turns out there's this one study and they're basically reporting some, well, we, we were able to get a, you know, some of that you know, biomass to sink to depth. Several problems with that. That's it's just one study. All the other studies I've seen, basically what happened was the following. The phytoplankton did not really sink to depth. Now, when you get a particulate matter of, uh, uh, sinking through the water column, we, we call it marine snow. But you usually have to be of a certain size, you know, so that they can over, uh, you know, overtake viscosity issues, buoyancy issues, and so forth. What, uh, what most studies have found is that while there may have been an initial pulse of increased productivity, that in initial pulse tended to stay in the upper layers of the water where they then got consumed by zo uh, zooplankton and other you know, secondary uh, consumers. And guess what? They're uh, consumed by the zooplankton and they stay in the uh, shallow layers. They're just going to put that CO2 right back into the water. So it's almost like a net zero, a net sum game. You know, zero sum game. That's what I want to say. So, in essence, it didn't do what it was intended to do. So, for that reason, of you know, not that mo it's it for this one, except for this one study, all of the studies have shown it to be inconclusive, not working. You may have an initial pulse, but that was it. Why the initial pulse? The initial pulse, because as some researchers have stated, the ocean biogeochemistry is already pretty fine-tuned. So all that's going to happen is you may have an initial pulse, but it's going, it's going to go back to its finely tuned, I won't say equilibrium state, but near equilibrium state, so that the excess iron does not get utilized. So now all we've done is we've basically introduced a pile of ferrous sulfate. That was the solution used. Ferrous sulfate iron. Ferrous is the lower uh, 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 cation state. It's, uh, iron comes in two uh, valences. You have uh, plus two and plus three. The plus two is the ferrous. That's the old terminology. Plus three is the ferric. The plus two is the one that tends to be more soluble in solution, so they're using that. So basically, you're just putting, and it's not just, oh, you know, throw a little kilogram of iron here and, you know, ferrous sulfate here and there. It was quite an undertaking. You know, they were putting the solution, very large volumes of it, into the ocean. So now you're putting all this stuff into the ocean. It's not really being utilized. So what's that going to do to the biochemistry uh, chemistry of the oceans? That was one of the reasons why, especially with the not very promising results, that the uh, program ended. So when I say it was a failure, this is why I say it was a failure. The null hypothesis, if you want to look at, you know, testing hypothesis, was that, okay, adding iron to promote phytoplankton growth will not significantly affect the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere. The alternative hypothesis would be that adding uh, iron solution will promote phytoplankton growth, and will significantly reduce the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. After all the results came in, the null hypothesis had to be accepted. 
It did not work. It did not do what it was intended. That's why I said it was a failure. Here's another thing I wanted to mention why it, the iron seeding did not work. While the iron promoted initial growth, the, the macronutrients, the nitrogens, the phosphates, they got used up. So that was another reason why you might have all, have all this iron, but without the nitrogen and the phosphorus, the phytoplanktons could not add biomass. They could not continue to photosynthesize with the appropriate nutrients. So for, for all these reasons, this is an example of un, in, unexpected outcomes, unintended consequences, it not working. So yeah, you can put a lot of iron and have a lot of it available, but without the nitrogen and phosphorus, not much is going to happen. And this is basically part of the, part of the problem of what happened there. So while there might have been an initial pulse of productivity, it was not sustained. And in order for the, to have a significant drawdown of CO2, this has to be sustained. And it simply was not. So, and, and another thing is, as the oceans are warming up, the, the thermal hailing flow is slowing down. The vertical uh, flow of water helps facilitate the sinking of marine snow, sequestering that material to death, that's slowing down, so that sequestration process is not going to take place. So for, for that reason, the in, initial burst only, not continuous, the uncertainty, you know, basically having a, a zero-sum result, and the uncertainties involving what this, you know, adding this ferrous sulfate solution by a, a very large amount will do to the biochemistry, that being an unknown. For all these reasons, the program was stopped, and for all these reasons, the program was deemed a failure. So um, I stand by my comment. It was a failure. It did not do what the intended objective was. Initial births, while that sounds perhaps encouraging, it didn't last. And if we want to, and, that, and that's the problem with a lot of these geoengineering schemes. You may get a promising initial result, but it's not sustained. And also when it comes to geoengineering, there are always going to be parameters, there's always going to be interactions that simply are unexpected, unanticipated, and it ends up with... Uh, Results that was, was not uh, counted on, was not desired. I liken this to in chaos theory that any slight changes, any slight perturbations in initial condition will lead to completely wild, wildly different results. And that is a major reason why geoengineering will never work. And let's face it. We're trying to undo several centuries of what humans have been doing in a decade. Hmm, not likely, I hate to say. So, um, overall, geoengineering schemes um, tend not to work because of the complexity of the planet, because of the complexity of the parameters and the interactions. And the, also, in order for it to really be successful, you have to employ it, implement them on a very wide scale, which, you know, let's be honest, is beyond a lot of capacities uh, right now. So, um, so, so there you have it. Iron seeding was a failure. The as I said the results were not any significantly increased productivity and um, the program was ended. So I hope this uh, addresses that issue, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you for your time.